Jim Nichols here. Welcome to our second Sweet Singles Bible Study. If you've ever known someone or met someone who's totally preoccupied with the second coming of Jesus, you've probably heard various theories and speculations as to just who the Antichrist is in the book of Revelation, or as so often people like that mistakenly put it, the book of Revelations. Now, there's something to throw back at such speculators. Did you know that the term Antichrist doesn't occur anywhere in the book of Revelation? It does occur in the text we're reading here today, and it doesn't refer to the beast that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. Let's go to our study. Love, Truth, and Antichrist. This is taken from the text of Second John. Let's begin our study by reading the first three verses of our text. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Now, you and I will find much preoccupation with the return of Christ, which would make this single chapter epistle most popular with those who spend a lot of time in eschatology, the study of last days. It seems only appropriate that we deal with the only one chapter epistle which gives mention of Antichrist. But students of the Bible are in for a little shocker to find from this text the marks of such a person and the fact that Antichrist is not any one person, such as the beast from Revelation 13, but a class of persons. What's more, the identifying characteristics of Antichrist should give everyone in the church reason for concern. Our study will briefly cover the usual background questions, such as who wrote it, to whom, when, where, and why, but most of our time will be spent on the marks of Antichrist and the church's response to Antichrist. The second epistle of John, commonly referred to as Second John, was written by John the Apostle late in the course of his ministry. Berge's commentary accepts the most popular concept that all three epistles were written in the order they are preserved in the New Testament canon. That being the case, Second John is an elaboration on how to deal with the Gnostics. In 1 John, we read of how to discern the difference. Here in 2 John, we read the admonition to separate ourselves from them. The approximate date is A.D. 90. This would be near the close of the life of John and among the final three books of the New Testament. Although the author does not identify himself as John, he simply calls himself the Elder, his style is consistent with that of John. The subject matter is decidedly John's, and conservative scholars and church fathers attribute the book to John. The recipient is more a matter of dispute. Since the book is addressed to the chosen lady and her children, there are some who say it was written to a widow who was active in the church, while others say it is codified language to identify a specific congregation. It's suggested that the persecution of the church was sufficiently escalated at this time to have necessitated familiar terms to identify the author and recipients without naming names. In short, the recipient was either a woman with a family or a church. The original recipients knew. The rest of us don't. To insist it must be one or the other is actually to speak where scripture is silent. The reason for the letter is to separate the church from the Gnostic heresy. While there are other people at other times who've subverted the basic gospel message, John is dealing specifically with a group 
which has denied the incarnation and try to frame Jesus as a, as a type of phantom savior. They've basically merged some Christian doctrine with Platonic philosophy and some of the ele elements of a mystery religion. Besides a characteristic doctrine, there's also a clearly discernible distinction between the behavior of Gnostics and the behavior of Christians. The early Christian community was noted by its fervent love of one member for the other. You notice that in, in the introductory verses we read. This identifying characteristic is something clearly missing in the Gnostics. John is insistent in his letters that the church maintain that saltiness whereby it preserved the world. Jesus predicted that the world would believe our message if we fulfill his one new commandment, that we love one another even as he has loved us. Let's read on. Verse 4. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. Some of her children are walking in the truth. Well, apparently some are not. These would be those who've been turned by the Gnostic heresy. No spiritually sensitive child of God would read this line without rejoicing at the report of those walking in the truth and grieving at the realization that some others are no longer walking in the truth. Let's read on verse 5. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing to you a new command but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. John gives several different characteristics of love, especially in 1 John, but in this specific passage, he identifies love by walking in the commandments of God. It was Jesus who said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In connection to the commandments of the Lord is the new commandment that the Lord gave his disciples that we love one another. Now, apparently the Gnostics weren't doing a very convincing job of loving others because John is contrasting them by this characteristic or lack thereof. On we read. Verse 7, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. At the core of Gnosticism was a denial of the physical as flawed and sinful. Only the spirit realm was real and ideal. This is Platonism. Since Jesus was perfect and without sin, they reasoned, he could not have had actual flesh. He was, according to their teaching, an emanation from the spirit realm. His death on the cross was an illusion since he had no flesh and blood. Now, if you had this secret wisdom, you knew that real spirituality was divorced from how you lived in the physical world, and this caused two extremes in Gnostic lifestyles, asceticism, a withdrawal from all the physical, or licentious living, which simply said, well, the physical is irrelevant, since all that really matters is the spiritual. Let's read on, verses 8 and 9. Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, briefly, the question of eternal security is addressed in this passage, as Christians are warned not to lose their salvation. Verse 8. Departure from salvation here is spoken of as running ahead. 
and not continuing in the teaching of Christ. Now the term teaching of Christ is another term used to identify the body of sound doctrine that's called the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's from Jude, and we'll be getting to that in another study soon. Acts 2.42 speaks of it as the apostles' teaching. There was a set and accepted body of doctrine given to Christians. It was not to be changed or deviated from, according to Galatians 1.8 and 9. This was written down by the apostles and their close associates while the apostles were still alive, and it is what today constitutes our New Testament. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Naturally, the people regurgitating the doctrine of Antichrist were not to be listened to. Within the church, they were not to be shown hospitality, shared a meal, given a place to stay. To entertain a false teacher as a guest in your home or around your dinner table was to show your approval of that person and be a participant in his blasphemous doctrine. How far do we apply the command not to eat with or receive such a person? Does this make any variance in doctrine a basis for disfellowshipping a person? Now, in my small opinion, I would hasten to repeat the old restoration slogan, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. For instance, does the acceptance of an individual depend upon his view of eternal security? Or how about his millennial viewpoint? Could I, as a preacher, cooperate with denominational churches to help those close down, help them close down those dirty bookstores in town? But what about participation in, say, a joint evangelistic crusade where we would be at variance on the teaching of the plan of salvation? Those are things that have to be weighed. Steering a straight course through the matter of upholding the sound doctrine with an ironic spirit is a difficult challenge. Absolute disfellowshipping should be reserved for the clearest case of denial of the basic gospel message particularly when that denial is confronted with a final authority. In John's day, it was the apostles' teaching. Today, it is the completed New Testament scriptures. How far do we apply the command not to eat with or not to receive such a person? Does this make any variance in doctrine a, a basis of defellowshipping? Perhaps not. But if it clearly is erroneous teaching, we owe it to the individual, first of all, to try to correct him privately. If he will not hear us, then we need to get witnesses. And if still he will not change from his false doctrine, which is contrary to what is clearly found in Scripture, then we need to tell it to the church. In the late 1800s, German rationalism had assailed the sound body of doctrine, questioning anything miraculous, particularly the virgin birth of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and several other miracles. In the 1960s, modernism had affected the church so much that theologians were embracing the God is dead movement. The current generation now sees relativistic truth as a newer form of denial of sound doctrine by what is called postmodernism. Every generation has its challenge from Antichrist. Basically, it's the denial of the second sound teaching first given by the apostles as was preserved for us in the New Testament scriptures. If we would be among those who are commended for walking in the truth, as John commended uh, the children of the elect lady, then we need to be those who regard God's word as truth 
and the Lord's word in our lives in a way that affirms our acceptance of the truth because we're walking in it. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful to know it is truth. Thank you that we can be assured of the things that have been taught us in the pages of scripture that they happened, that what Jesus did for us is real and irrevocable. May we live it out in our lives in such a way that people can understand these words are true. Lord, help us to recognize the spirit of Antichrist as that spirit rears his ugly head from time to time in the, in the culture around us and in our own lives of doubt and fear. May we be willing to combat him with the sword of the spirit. Equip us with the full armor of God, we pray in Jesus name, amen. Next week we'll be in third John, Lord willing, we'll see you then.